Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session today. Uh, we are very happy to have Maureen to join us, and she will be presenting her work on financial market ethics. Uh, just a few announcements before we start it. Our next workshop will be Mad Money Meeting, co-organized with Bank of Canada, and it will start on February 10th. And our next speaker is Funu. And then just a reminder, um, all audience are welcome to use the Q&A chat function during the talk and panelists can ask questions anytime during the talk. And we would really like to thank all the panelists who can join us today. Okay, I will pass the screen to Maureen now. Your turn. Okay, let me... Uh, let me share the screen. Is everyone seeing it? Are we good? Yeah. Great. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to present this paper today. It is joint with uh, David Easley, and David's on this uh, seminar too, so hopefully we'll be able to uh, answer questions. We're very much looking forward to feedback. Uh, this is not a topic that you often see in seminars, so I appreciate all of you coming and, and seeing something that's a little bit off the beaten path. Um, let me, um, let me sort of tee up sort of where we're going with this, that if you think about ethics and economics, it's just not really commonplace. Um, and it's not an oversight, right? For many people, the way that uh, Ken Arrow looks at this is similar to the way perhaps that they do, where I like this quote, he said, like many economists, I don't wanna to rely too heavily on substituting ethics for self-interest is best you know, ethics plays a role when the price system breaks down. I think this sort of approach draws on a tradition in economics that markets work best when rational agents all act in their own self-interest. Um, but in actual markets, ethics seems to play a lot of, a, a big role in affecting performance and viability. And that's certainly the case, I think, in the financial market. Uh, the paper we're going to present today, I think, can actually apply more broadly, but we're going to put it, you know, use examples and settings in the financial markets. But, you know, the, the underlying issue, I think, is bigger than that. I think the financial crisis also raised some very interesting questions about on how unethical behavior can spread and induce similar malfeasance in others. So in this paper, we're really going to try and think about the role of market ethics. And we, we have two particular questions in mind. We want to ask whether rational agents can care about ethical concern and whether those rational agents can survive in equilibrium. And we also want to ask about can ethical or non-ethical behavior propagate the market, right? Are there properties of networks in which non-ethical behavior spreads from node to node? And can you stop it? And then conversely, can ethical behavior be contagious? contagious? Can, can we think about you know, markets as networks and then think about how, how would ethics fit into all of this? Um, the approach we're gonna take is a new approach. Uh, it's out there in the literature, but hasn't really been applied in the direction we're gonna take it. Uh, we're gonna draw on results from psychological game theory and uh, from contagion in networks. And we're gonna develop a game theory model that allows agents to care about other agents' expectations of their behavior. So what's kind of fun about the model we build is that our agents are what we would call rational morality. Um, they will change. They, they can decide to play ethically or they can decide to play non-ethically. And we'll, we'll sort of look at how that affects the network and what happens there. We're going to characterize equilibrium strategies with uh, the focus on the switching behavior. We're going to embed this game theory model in a network. And then we're going to think about how the network structure leads to ethical and non-ethical behavior diffusing across the network. So sort of a new approach um, that we want to do. I actually don't want to relate it. Uh, I think it's kind of fun to think that you know sometimes what's new is old. Um, and in particular, in a psychological game, agents care about what other agents expect them to do. But this is actually reminiscent of Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments. Uh, for those of you who've kept up on your reading, this was published in 1758. So uh, you may have to go back a while to find it. But Smith argued that we gain happiness from the approbation of others. 
And so we should act as if to satisfy the expectations of an impartial spectator. And he goes on in the theory of moral sentiments to say, and then we should embed that impartial spectator internally so that our choices reflect not only our immediate ones, but also our moral sentiments connected with the expectations of others. So I, I think it's kind of fun to think about sort of juxtaposing the new, the psychological game theory with the old, which is sort of thinking about this from this somewhat different perspective than perhaps we typically do. And hopefully we can convince you, you get some kind of fun insights in looking at this. I want to motivate this with just some examples. These are in the paper if you had a chance to read it, but for those of you who have it, right? When we, when we think about why is this important now, I, I do think that the financial markets have had their share of um, sort of bad behavior, right? And, you know, those of you in finance, um, you know, it, it is frustrating to me that financial services has placed dead last seven years in a row in the Edelman Global Trust Index. So this isn't sort of some mythical thing that's worried a little bit about bad behavior and trust and ethics and all that. I mean, it's, it's real. And so here's sort of an example, I'll pick on Europe, um, but you know, we could do the same thing picking on the US. Um, since 2013, the EU has fined seven banks for manipulating the Euro benchmark derivatives market, six banks for, rich, for rigging interest rate derivatives, three banks for colluding on the Swiss franc, and in 2019 accused eight banks of colluding to gain the Euro bond market. And in this last example, one of the things they point out is this spread across banks until roughly a third of all the banks in the Euro bond market were involved in manipulating. So is this an example of contagion of unethical behavior across a network? Maybe, we'll see. If we turn the other direction, one of my favorites of late has been the manufactured default issue of Blackstone. I'm sure that many of my colleagues know all about this, but um, for those who don't, this is fun. And talk, it's fun to talk about with your MBAs if you teach them. Um, Blackstone bought credit default swaps on a firm and simultaneously lent the money with the precondition that the firm delay its next bond payment, which would then trigger the credit default swaps and give Blackstone a help to pay off. Now, technically it wasn't illegal, but it created a firestorm in the market. And basically Blackstone stepped down from enforcing its claim. Is this an example of ethical behavior prevailing in the employer? Maybe. We'll, we'll talk about these later as we go through. So the other advantage of building a model to begin to understand how these things could happen is it also can allow us to figure out how might we get to the equilibrium that we want. And in particular, how could we use market design and regulation to facilitate ethical behavior? So that's kind of where I hope I get to uh, before the end of this seminar. Maureen, can I ask you a question? Um, sure. I it's just um, the way you're defining ethics here, it sounds a lot like norms. So for you, what's the, is there a distinction between ethics and norm following well, in, in your, the way you think about this? I think that's a great question. This is, our work is certainly related to the social norms area. One of the things that's going to happen here is that our, our ethics here is that you're going to care about what other people expect you to do. And if they expect you to do, you're going to feel guilty. Um, and one of the things that's gonna happen here is our ethical behavior will arise endogenously. Uh, often in the norms, the norms are exogenous. Um, um, it may become clearer as we go along. So let me, let me give that as a simple sort of answer right now. And then let me come back to it if in fact you think that later on it fits in a little better. Is that okay? But Maureen, can I just follow up? I, I know you want to move on. Just one question. So, you know, when you brought up the Adam Smith quote, you were saying sort of yeah. like a, an exogenous impartial observer. But then the, the answer you just gave is that there's going to be an equilibrium object. So if everyone ex expects me to do something good or bad, violating that is seems like it's going to be violating ethics. So just how do I recognize yeah, that? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Can I, can I hang on to it just 
a couple Absolutely. of slides until we get to the psychological games. And sure. then let me show you how we're going to model it. Um, and then at that point, if you don't kind of like it, then I'm going to, I'll dump it on Dave and have him give a better answer. But uh, hang on just a minute and let me, let me get back down there because your That's questions you're asking are exactly right on target. Right. Okay. So one question just about interpretation, given you gave examples or these are organizations like Blackstone and you have yeah. individuals in the model. So do we want to, what, what is the unit in this thing? Is it a firm or is it a person? And it can be either. We're going to have, we're going to call them agents. But right. another way to think about what's going on is you, a node, right? You could have a node be Blackstone. And right. one of the people at Blackstone is actually playing the game. Right. Um, so, you know, if you think about, you know, traders at a bank, right? Yeah. UBS may have lots of traders. This particular trader is the one playing the game. So there are no okay. organizations or coalitions or anything, but that there's a certain, all the people in a given bank play the same strategy. Well, you can also pick it random. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you yeah. know, it, you're right. You know, it gets a little tricky. You know, modeling yeah. UBS is a little challenging. So we're, we're going to focus on nodes. For simplicity, you can call that node a single agent, but, um, you know, they could be a desk and one person at that desk is playing. That's Got where it. we're going to go. Um, so you're exactly right that, you know, we want to be very clear, you know, and when you start with exciting literature from 1758, you, you clearly do want to stress that you're not the first person to come up with all of this. Um, the psychological games we're going to rely on was uh, designed by Gianna Coppolis et al. and, and Betagali et al. Um, and you can see it's actually been around a while, but it hasn't, at least in finance, really had much um, use made of it yet. Uh, cultural and social norms agreed. Our work is going to relate to this, um, but it'll be, I think, a little different as you see as we develop it. We're going to rely on, we're also relating to the reciprocity in games literature. It's a very interesting paper by Alger and Weiber on evolution and morality that is kind of asking questions like we are, but in a very sort of different framework. Um, and then more directly um, for many of us, the contagion and financial networks literature. Uh, these are some of the very important papers, but certainly we didn't write them all down. So if we didn't miss, if we missed yours, I apologize. Um, and there's also a, a large literature in finance now on empirical misconduct studies. So. You know, here people have looked at a wide variety of bad things that we've been doing in the finance. Um, but the paper that I think is most relevant and one that we'll come back to is Parsons, Suleman, and Titman. They found a really interesting paper about the geography of financial misconduct, that financial misconduct tends to come in clusters. And uh, they wondered, you know, about why that would be the case. It's a very interesting paper. And uh, one of the things that our model is going to do is provide an explanation for some of those um, interesting results that they have. So, um, you know, we, we kind of fit in a bunch of places. No one's exactly like us, but, you know, certainly a lot of people are interested in some of these same issues. So let's try and add some substance to what we're doing so we can explain better how, how we fit in. Um, what the game is a two player game embedded in an underlying network, right? So players play games against each other, but they play a game when we put it in the network, they're playing lots of these games. And each agent chooses each period to play either ethically or non-ethically. And by ethical, we mean that agents care about other expectations of their behavior. And I'll make this clearer still in a minute when we do psychological games. So if you don't really care what others are doing, you just sort of say, hey, you know, I don't care about you. I do what I'm doing. We're calling that non-ethical. That's not saying it's unethical. It's just non -ethical. If instead I'm going to care about what it is that you expected me to do, that's going to fit into our category of ethical. And we'll show you why when we implement it in the psychological game frame. Agents are actually, it's a, two, it's a two player game, but they're playing many of them. And agents are gonna choose a single behavior for all the interactions in a period. So they're gonna play this game many times, but um, 
we're not going to essentially, but we do not, they do not view their interactions as a repeated game. And I think it's important here because, you know, a natural question is, well, wait a minute, what about replications, et cetera? In this setting, we analyze an infinitely repeated game and we do show in the appendix of the paper that for sufficiently low but non-zero discount factors, the one period game we analyze is consistent with a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium of the infinite horizon game, right? So in that game, they wouldn't form uh, and exploit expectations, uh, would build and exploit rep reputations. Um, so we can talk about that later, perhaps in the discussion, but um, in this setting that, you know, the, the structure we're looking at allows us to focus on these, these interactions this way. Um, what's interesting about psychological games is it allows payoffs to depend directly on beliefs rather than just on actions in traditional game theory. So now let's add a little more meat. So in, in our game, a player experiences guilt and then a re, and thus a reduction in payoff if he disappoints others. So if you think I'm gonna play ethically, but I don't play ethically, and I think that you think that I'm gonna play ethically, then it's, I feel guilty when I don't do it. I may not do it. I may choose to play non ethically, but I feel guilty and it does reduce my payoff. So the key point in our analysis is that the payoff reduction from behaving non ethically is endogenous. It only occurs when others expect ethical behavior. So to put this into a context that may be more familiar, this is Jack Sparrow. You remember perhaps Pirates of the Caribbean, the great scene in Pirates of the Caribbean where one of the players says to Captain Jack, you lied to me. And he says, I'm a pirate. So it's the idea here, right? I mean, of course a pirate's gonna lie to you. So if, if you think people think you're gonna be non-ethical and you behave non-ethically, you don't feel bad, you know, who cares? Um, so, that's what makes this kind of an interesting kind of world. Um, so it's only if people think that you're gonna be ethical and you're not ethical that you feel the guilt. So that leads us to the payoff matrix for the two player game. And let's see if we can explain how this is gonna work, all right? So our choices are ethical or non-ethical. Um, we're gonna have in the paper different parameter assumptions as we go through, but the base model starts with this one. Um, so here's the payoff if we both are at, and behave ethically. Here's the payoff if we both behave non-ethically. And here's obviously what happens if I behave ethically and you don't, et cetera. Um, the key thing here is, you know, we have these A's and B's and C's, but the interesting part that introduces it, we have this G, which is a guilt factor. And you have this alpha hat and beta hat. So alpha hat is player one's expectation of player two's expectation um, of the probability that player one plays ethic. So it really is, you know, it's what does Doug Diamond, what do I think Doug Diamond thinks that I'm gonna do, right? In terms of ethical behavior. It's what do you think that, you know, what, what is my expectation of your expectation of my, my probability of playing ethic? And that's the alpha hat. And here's the, here's the beta hat. This is um, player two's expectation of player one's, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And just so a if, oh, just sorry. one sec. Alpha, yeah. So if, if I think that you think that I'm going to play ethically, uh, then alpha, alpha hat is one, right? Whereas if I think that you don't think that I'm gonna play ethical, then it's zero, right? So you're only gonna have this guilt parameter be operative if the alpha one or the beta ones are one. Okay, question? Yes, I just wanted a clarification. Uh, I can think of this payoff matrix as uh, a guilt augmented uh, prisoner, prisoner dilemma or is it? That's exactly right. right. That's exactly right. So in the, that, good point. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. In this simpler structure uh, that we're going to look under these base assumptions, it really is a prisoner's dilemma with this psychological games added in. Later, we're going to change these parameters to make guilt less demanding, so uh, less dominant. So if you look at this game, right, we're all better off, if you think of it as a society, if we all played ethically. 
because of the way things work, A is bigger than B. But if I cheat, I can be better off, right? So if you, you know, it depends on your worldview. My worldview was, you know, why do people cheat? Because they make themselves better off. But if we all cheat, we're not as well off as we would have been if we were all ethical. So you're exactly right, it's a prisoner's dilemma. Later, we're gonna change this a little bit because what's gonna happen here is that non-ethical behavior becomes a dominant strategy. And we'd like to put it in a world where it's not quite so dominant. So we're gonna shift these around later in the paper. And then instead of a prisoner's dilemma, we have a coordination game. So you can do a lot with this framework and it becomes kind of fun. But that's, that's a great point. Marin, uh, just a question about this NN outcome, right? So it feels like that if the other person is uh, behaving ethically and I'm not, then I will feel guilt. But if both of us sort of like uh, doing non-ethical behavior, maybe in this case, like uh, I should not feel as guilty. So did you think about like this particular like, kind of nuance, I would say? Yep, that's a great point. I mean, what we have is you only feel guilty if people thought you were going to be ethical. Right. And you're right. You could have said, well, you know, they thought I was kind of a jerk, but they didn't think I was that much of a jerk. You could have done that. We we haven't done that here, but you're right. You could. And I think one of the things that's fun about this framework is that you can do a lot of things with it. Right. We, we wanted to kind of make it simpler. But, you know, as I'll show you when we get into the networks. Right. You might say, well, Maybe I feel guilty towards some people in the network, but I don't feel guilty towards other people in the network or, you know, along those lines. You can do all that, right? You could put greater weight on the edges against the center or center versus you. You, could, you can do all that stuff. Um, we have it because this is kind of complicated enough for now. But I think for, you know, as we think about other applications down the road for using this, I think for some of those applications, some of those sort of complications would actually be quite important. So it's a very good point. Related to Michael's question, who, whose beliefs um, are the ones that generate guilt? I only see the people next to me, but does everybody later see something about this so that I could be concerned? That, that I'm going to see, right, I'm going to see everybody I have an edge with. Just, right. So that's all I ever see then. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, it, but again, you can have lots and lots of edges. Um, so that's where we're going. Maureen, I also have a clarification question. So players choose whether to behave ethically or not ethically, mm -hmm. but they do not choose whether they feel guilty or not. Right. That's so, a parameter in the model. So you, you will feel guilty. Okay, so you will only, you, right, if other people expect you to behave ethically and you don't, right, um, then you'll feel guilty, right? Um, do I also choose, okay, I guess my question is, do I also choose when I, what to expect about other people or how, do I choose, um, to, do I choose well, what, to expect that other people will behave ethically or not? So one of the things that's going to happen when we put this in a network is that people are going to see how you behaved last time. And so if you behaved ethically last time, then they're going to assume you're going to behave ethically this time, right? If you behave non-ethically last time, then they're going to assume you played non-ethically last time. So they're going to base their expectations, um, at least in this part of the paper, on your prior plan. Right. So that's that's how it's going to evolve. Now, if you change the next time you play ethically and last time you didn't, then I wouldn't in the future think you're going to play ethically. So it can evolve. Maureen, I have a very quick question for you. Uh, alpha hat and beta hat, they're estimated before because these are exposed payoffs. So is alpha hat, beta hat, ex ante or exposed? Uh, they're, well, they're what you think they expect. So they're they're ex, they're ex ante. Right, they're they're based on what I think what the other person. After the did. game, they know you cheated effectively, so they will update at that point. That's so right, because now they it's saw based that on the ex ante. It's based on the ex ante view. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. All right. So let's talk about. Oh, sorry, I have another one. Uh, you told us at the beginning that ethic, ethical behavior was a lot about what about expectation of others and. But, the, but by setting that 
payoff matrix you 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 do take a stand right because the the ee entry corresponds to the to Pareto optimality there the it does correspond to to an outcome that we view as desirable right uh, collectively uh, well in this setting it is because of the way we set the parameters up right a a is a good outcome um, yeah. we all would that that if you will, this consumer surplus is higher, if you want to think mm -hmm. about it that way, mm -hmm. the total payoffs, right? Maybe I'm not answering your question. David, did you understand no. it differently? Uh, yes, I, I had a similar Actually, the question. slide you just put up answers some of the questions because the whole point, the, the next part of this is that this is done in equilibrium so that the expectations are correct, right? So a player has his expectation, others' expectation of his play in an equilibrium, all of those expectations must be correct in the actual play. But that's actually but, your, your current slide. <laughs> but but I, I had a similar question to Pierre that it seems important that AA was the best uh, outcome for interpreting what we mean by ethics, right? If we had a different game where you know we expected you yeah. know each other to murder somebody, then it'd be unethical in that game not to murder somebody, right? I think that's a bizarre example, right? I mean, later on we'll change the the parameters. No, no, no but I, I I agree it's a bizarre example, but 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 it, I guess the idea was it seemed the definition of ethics depends on both the specific definition that I incur some cost if I don't do what you believe, but also the the payoff structure that that we assume in the game. Is that right or? Well, uh, first off, one would argue that the argument is their honor among thieves would actually fit nicely with your murder example. If you expected someone to be part of your cabal and they didn't do what you expected, then you're disappointed in them, right? But I think that example is a bit bizarre, right? It, the structure we've set up here that AA necessarily maximizes social welfare isn't necessary for our results. It's just an example. And we're gonna change those parameters later in the paper to show you worlds where AA isn't necessarily the optimal outcome from a society's point of view, okay? Sure. Um, maybe this will become clearer if we go through a little bit more. So as David mentioned, we're here, what, what are we looking at? Here we're looking at a psychological mass equilibrium. It's a pair of strategies, one for each player, beliefs about the other player's strategies and beliefs about beliefs such that each player responds to the strategy of the other player and each player's beliefs are correct, right? So this looks like a Nash equilibrium, but with character, right? There's a whole lot going on here. And one of the things that's gonna be important, you've mentioned you know, these parameters are important. They are important for a variety of reasons. Here's one, here's the guilt parameter. If the guilt parameter G is less than C minus A, remember A was the payoff for both playing ethically and C is when one plays non-ethically. If G is too little, if there's not enough guilt in this, in this you know, framework, then, then N is strictly dominant and the unique equilibrium is N, N. Right? So if you thought about G being kind of zero, this is kind of the world where we're used to, where we don't think about these ethical dimensions, right? And we end up with N, N. But provided that guilt is big enough, then there can be multiple equilibria. We can end up with an N, we can end up with EE. We also can end up in mixed strategies, but we're not actually going to um, focus on the mixed strategies as kind of standard, trying to get rid of that, that issue. So we're gonna focus on the pure strategy equilibrium. So let's just sort of get on the same page about a network. Um, so again, I know most of you are very familiar with this, but perhaps not everyone. So players are uh, nodes. So player I is a node. So here's I and J and K. These are all these are all players. And edge means that two, two nodes are playing a game with each other. So J is playing with K and J is playing with I. And then there's others in this network as well. Right? So a player's payoff depends on its play, the play of its neighbors and what those neighbors expected to do. So if you think about where we've been, we talked about a two-player game, but now there's lots of two-player games, right? So 
In the previous example, you can see as long as you're linked to somebody, you're playing a game with them. And so we assume that each player expects its player, its neighbors to play as they did in the previous period. So if you played non-ethically last time, then you're going to play non-ethically this time, as that's a and dominant strategy. So in the parameter structure that we've got right now, if you if you play non-ethically, you're going to you're going to stay there. You're not going to change because it's dominant. But if you play ethically, um, then and the parameter that we're interested in this g greater than c minus a, if that won't prevail, then um, you know will they play ethically going forward or will they swap? That's kind of the issues that we're going to look at. So how do we figure this out? Well, if node E played uh, ethically before, then it's optimal play now. Depends on what the neighbors are expected to do. So how many neighbors do you have is the degree. So let D be the degree of all the neighbors you're linked to, right? And let P be the fraction of neighbors expected to play E. So if you think about, you're going to play E, node, the node is going to play E if what? If the payoff to picking E is bigger than the payoff to not picking E. So if you want to figure out where did we get this from, here's the payoff in our two-player game. But I'm playing with D, neighbors, and P is the probability they're playing ethically. So probability, it's the fraction rather that are playing ethically. So PDA is your payoff from all these games if you play ethically. And this is your payoff from all these games if you play non -ethical. Notice that the Ds cancel, there's a D everywhere. That's really important because what it says is, is that the, the, it's independent of the scale, right? And that, that's really kind of gonna be nice for us going forward. Okay, so if, if you bought this, which you should, then the question is, okay, I'm going to play ethically if this holds. Well, I can now solve for what fraction of my neighbors would have to be playing ethically for me to be playing ethically, right? And so the critical value turns out to be this P double star, such that a node will continue to play ethically if at least P double star of its neighbors play. Okay, so now we've got this network, playing this game, trying to figure out what to do. And now it's gonna come down to, well, what do I think my neighbors are gonna do? You know, what do they think I'm doing? That sort of thing. And so let's think about sort of this picture again, right? So this guy, if you think about it, he's trying to figure out what to do this time. Last time he played ethically, he's got, one neighbor who played ethically and another neighbor who played non-ethically. He'll play ethically if P double star is less than a half or equal, right? If, if it's equal, then from the previous slide, it, it, it will assume he plays ethically. So this is the calculation that he goes through to figure out what to do, right? So hopefully we're kind of on the same page, hopefully. Well, one quick question. So yeah. it these players aren't allowed to di differentiate between their, their neighbors <clears throat> and no. play different things against different neighbors? No. So, okay. um, they, uh, they, they, you know, we're assuming that every, every person, every node is going to play the same with all their neighbors. And, and David, you may want to address this. The we've talked about these extensions, David. Yeah. So actually, I mean, that's a really good question because you could imagine situations under which with some groups of neighbors, I might want to play ethically and with others not ethically based on the type of interactions. And we played around a little bit with this. I think we can do that. We haven't done it yet. Um, part of the reason I'm optimistic is that there is a literature um, looking at play of this sort where you allow two different types of behavior. Where the classic example is people choosing to be bilingual so they can interact with both English and French speakers. It's more costly, but doable. Um, and I, th I think we could do that here too. I think it'd be an interesting thing to try to do because then you could imagine that you're embedded in a network with some interactions that are more social, some that are more economic and you play differently in different settings. Could I ask um, So, yes. 
Um, so the independence, the implication of the independence of the uh, degree you presented a couple of slides ago is that uh, what's relevant for the uh, the insights you're developing is not whether the market is small or large, but instead whether the, the network is dense or not, or, or how sparse it is. Okay. Excellent. Yep, I should have said that. Uh, that's exactly right. And I have one more question. Um, what does a link represent here? Is it any trading relationship or a transparent one? So I'm trying to imagine what an exchange would mean here. So we typically model an exchange as a complete uh, graph, but then trading is anonymous. So actually that's something we'll come to at the very end of the paper, because you're right. You know, when we have like dealer market, I, you know, I, I'm the dealer, you're the customer, we know each other, we can form expectations. I think your insight is, is exactly right. You know, when you're an exchange, you know, how do I form an expectation like that? And so we will talk about that at the end of the paper and talk about maybe some market structures are more amenable to support ethical behavior than other market structures. So um, that's a good point. Oh, thank you. So let me turn to the questions I told you a while ago that we actually wanted to address. And what were they? They were questions about stability of the network and questions about cascades. So let's pose a simple question. If we start with everybody either playing ethically or not ethically, can you, a small number of nodes flipping to the other behavior, cause the new behavior to spread and possibly flip everybody to the new behavior, right? And if we have that, then we'll call that a complete cascade. So how would this work? Right, so think about a giant network, everybody all linked together the way whatever the network structure is. Each node is labeled either E or, or N. And you can start with either everybody playing non-ethically or everybody playing ethically. And now we're gonna, we're gonna switch some people from, suppose we were all playing ethically and now they're gonna, we're gonna switch some to playing non-ethically. Then each node will expect its neighbors to play as labeled. So if it's been, if it's swapped, right? Now you've seen the new, the new label on it. And now each node chooses its best response given this new you know, um, mutation in the network. The nodes are then labeled with the best responses and we repeat this and it goes on and on until what? Until it stops, until nobody swaps anymore and changes. So let me give an example, all right? In order to give the example, first we have to talk about something called densities. Um, so we're going to define a cluster of density P as a set of nodes such that each node in the set has at least fraction P of its neighbors in the set, right? So what does that mean? Well, like this one, the density is one, right? In this little set of, of red, everybody's in that set, so that's one, right? If we were to look at this node, and these red guys, what's their density? Well, suppose that we looked at, at, at um, uh, this guy, right? He's playing with him and he's playing with him, right? So half of his, of, of our, the density of this is a half. You take the smallest um, linkages, right? So, I mean, this guy plays with only people, but we don't care about him. The density of this set depends upon the minimum and it's this guy. And similarly, the density of this one is two thirds, right? And to see that, take this guy, he plays with one red one and you know, two, um, two blue ones, right? So two thirds of, of this blue one, it, it, that's the density. Now, why do we want that? Well, it's basically because cascades are determined by clusters and consider a network in which Every node initially plays E. Now we're gonna swap S of them playing N. If the remaining nodes and the edges between them contain a cluster of at least P double star, then you cannot get a complete cascade. That is, if you change this group of S nodes and uh, that to N, it, it can spread, but it can't take out the whole network if there is a cluster of density of at least P double star, which we talked about earlier. If, if a complete cascade doesn't occur, then in fact, the remaining network must have a cluster of at least P double star. 
So this is really kind of important. And let's see if we can make it clearer with a little example, right? So suppose P double star is 0. 0.6. Remember how we get P double star? It's from um, the parameters of the game and the probabilities that we're attaching to neighbors playing. So suppose everybody was ethical and then this one flipped exogenously to being non-ethical, right? Now, what's going to happen? Well, if you think about this guy and this guy, right? Well, when he's now trying to decide what to do, he's got two neighbors. One of them's playing non-ethically. One he thinks is going to be ethical, but P double star is 0.6. And, and his P is 0.5. And so as a result, he's going to swap. He'll become non-ethical. And the same calculation applies to this one. He'll become non-ethical. Now let's keep going, all right? Look, about, look at this guy, all right? Now his problem is he's got one playing ethically, but two thirds playing non-ethically. So his P is only one third. He's swapping out, right? Because he's at one third. You got to get a equal to at least 0.6, it's not going there, he swaps to. And finally, you can do the same analysis and he'll flip. But notice he won't, right? He won't flip because when you get here, he's got one neighbor playing non-ethically, but he's got two playing ethically. So this, this for him is 0.66, that's above 0.6, he stays ethical. So, what you see here is that the ethical behavior, the non-ethical behavior does not spread across the network, but it's because the density of this is enough to stop it. And, and that's what is gonna be kind of important to understand as we think about it, right? The density of this cluster stopped the uh, spread of the non-ethical behavior. People will continue to play ethically right, because it's higher than the cutoff, which was the P star. Now, why do we care about that? Well, it means that a configuration of play is stable. If each player is playing a best response and all play, players' beliefs are co correct. So what does it mean in our setting? Well, there's two stable configurations. One is everybody plays in, but the other is that any cluster of nodes who have a density above this P double star play E, and all other nodes play N. Now, what does that mean practically? It means that you're never gonna find ethical behavior scattered around. You're not gonna find one guy basically being ethical, um, you know, like, like a pepper shot. If you're gonna find ethical behavior, it has to be in clusters because it can't survive otherwise. It gets taken over by the ends. So you can find ends everywhere, but you're only going to find clusters of ends. That comes out of our model, but that actually is the empirical result that uh, Parsons, Suleiman, and Titman found when they looked at incidences of unethical behavior. And what they found is it clustered. You know, for example, Minneapolis or Indianapolis, one of them was really good and one of them was really bad, right? And it wasn't random. Um, they were able to, sh it's a very interesting paper, um, but it is consistent with sort of the model that we have that shows that, you know, ethical guys can survive, but they, they, they don't want to be lonely, at least in the structure that we've set up so far. Now, let's, let's make the structure more interesting, or it depends on your perspective, I guess, we get those all interesting, but suppose now that non-ethical behavior isn't so powerful. Remember, we, we set things up so that non-ethical dominated everything, right? So now there are two pure Nash equilibrium when you have this structure. You can get EE and you can get NA, right? You don't have the dominant equilibria that you had before. And now we have a coordination equilibrium. So what does it mean? Before, if you were non-ethical, you never switched, ever. You know, once non-ethical, you stayed that way. But now you can't. You can think of that, this model is allowing redemption, right? So the ethical people can, can turn evil if they want, but the unethical people can be redeemed. So we now have a coordination equilibrium, and now we're gonna end up with two critical values for cluster densities, right? So 
basically down here, this P, if we look at this, is the fraction who, are, who play ethically, right? And alpha, uh, whoops, this is the, no, this is the fraction who we, ex we expect to play ethically, I think. Am I right? Alpha is the probability of playing ethically. P is, David, you're, you're there. Am I getting P screwed up here? It's no, the fraction we expect. P is, P is the fraction my neighbor is playing ethically. Right, and alpha is the probability that I select to play yep. ethically. All right, so I don't think anybody's going to play ethically, right? So this P is really low. Then I don't play ethically either. Right, we're all down here. We don't play ethically, right? But as this fraction goes up, if I played ethically last time, then provided the fraction gets to here, I'll play ethically this time. If I played non-ethically last time, if the fraction that I think are going to play ethically is high enough, I'll switch to. So now you have this coordination game, if you will, right? And we're going to have two of these. Um, cutoff values, PE and PN. PN's higher, right? If I was not ethical before, I have to have more of the neighbors playing non-ethically for me to want to turn over to the good side, but I'll still potentially do it. And what's nice now is that we get a similar result to what we had before. So um, again, starting off with everybody playing one way or the other, switching around, uh, we do get that the process of nodes adjusting their behavior convergence. And this convergence is really important, right? Because if it didn't converge, then, you know, anything could happen. Or you could flip back and forth and do all kinds of weird things. But these things are converging. The results here look very similar. Um, in order to have, um, uh, you, you can't get a cascade if the densities are high enough. And if you don't see a cascade, the densities must have somewhere to stop that from happening. Now, um, so both clusters of E and N can be stable. Uh, the densities needed to each kind of stable can actually be fairly small. So now ethical behavior is not so unlikely. And they're gonna exhibit history dependence, which is kind of an interesting feature now that comes up. Um, and um, so in this structure, I know Matt has a paper where he has a very interesting model with history dependence. What's driving it here is different than in Matt's model, but um, you know, again, I think a, a very interesting outcome. Now I'm running out of time and I wanna get through two more things. So um, what if you think some people are hard, hardwired to play ethics, right? Um, and so, you know, the previous theorems apply, but now we're gonna have some people who doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. They just, they just do what they do, right? And, this can have a big effect. If the hardwired node is a gatekeeper, a node between every that, that exists between these paths, like here. So suppose J is evil and or turns not ethical, you know, his behavior can't get to K because it has to go through I. And if I is our gatekeeper who's ethical, it stops now. Right? So we have a bunch of things that we develop here, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably move on if you want to read about what the gatekeeper does. It's kind of interesting, but I think it's more interesting to get to sort of the implications of the model, right? Which is how can we make uh, society make ethical behavior more stable? Because now what we've shown is, you know, we, we can get there, but it's fragile. Uh, so how do we influence the outcomes away from non-ethical towards ethical? So for some of you who are familiar with classic papers like Doug Diamond's uh, on uh, bank runs, you know, how do, how do we get away from the bank run equilibria and get to the, to the you know, we don't do that. Um, in our setting, obviously very different, but let's think about it. Well, obviously one thing that would matter are the payoff structures and the guilt parameter. So reducing payoffs to playing non-ethically would, would help with this, but, um, Remember, this has to be done on an x any basis. So if you think about like how we often regulate, say, things like insider trading or other things where people are breaking laws, right, where the odds that you're going to get caught are minuscule and then maybe they give you a big penalty, that actually won't help here, right? It won't help at all. Um, you really would have to change things in a much more dramatic way, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
One thing you could do is increase the guilt factor. And you could try and regulate that, but actually I think that arises, is more effective when it arises naturally. So some of you are familiar, I think, with the fact that China has this list that they have of, of non-social behaviors and you end up on the list and you get points for jaywalking and, and for doing things that are not necessarily illegal, but are, you know, bad things. Now, whether that is a good example or not, it's not clear because some people argue this is used as a type of social control that has negative impacts. But I think social opprobrium actually does work. Um, in our library, uh, they had this cute practice of posting all the names of anyone uh, who had a late, uh, who had an overdue library books. So it was kind of fun in the in the community to be able to point out that you know so and so was on the list, and they were supposed to shame them into bringing back the books. I think the U.S. college admission scandal is kind of an example of this, right? That paying a proctor to take your kids SAT, you know, you, you're not sort of the as I mentioned in the paper, the crime of the century. But these people's lives have been ruined by the social opprobrium that attaches to it. And a more interesting, oh, rather more recent example is the, the LA Lakers. They borrowed 4.6 million from the payroll protection plan and then ended up deciding they better give it back because there were an awful lot of people who pointed out that they didn't understand why a privately owned $4 billion company took money intended to help small businesses. I think guilt had something to do with it. Wasn't illegal, they gave it back. So anything that can increase the guilt factor can work. I like this picture. I saw this when I was in China last year. I've been assured by my Chinese colleagues that it actually kind of says that, be civilized, uh, no climbing. Uh, I like that. Um, Rain, Marin. Yep, Marin. yep. Oh, my yep Michael. Uh, so um, it seems like that in the examples that you were given, uh, there is some shame that goes more than one link. So kind of people who are indirectly connected to you, kind of, you feel guilty about what they think. So in that sense, it seems like mm -hmm. a, there is that potential extension where there is a way for me to tell to my neighbors that you are not connected to, that uh, you did something unethical, and then they will potentially, in the, if you expect to deal with them in the future, it can uh, kind of in, like make this guilt factor a little bit stronger, like by expanding the kind of the range of this guilt in the network. Michael, I really like this. We've actually been working on something very akin to this, which is that you know, the concept we have of guilt in the paper right now is it's I think about what you think about me, right? But um, we actually had worked out an extension to the model that it, it's, it's actually more about what we think society thinks about me, which is much closer to the argument you have and actually kind of better with some of our examples, right? And we'd worked that out and it, it actually works nicely, but um, we didn't have time to put it in the paper and I didn't want to screw things up by putting it there, but I, we're all on the same wavelength. I, I think building in a broader concept of guilt actually seems to, to, to work even better with respect to how it might, might work in the market. So that, that's a great idea. It seems like that's related um, to whether you need re regulation or not. You know, you could imagine that the just, you know, social opprobrium or suppose yeah. the outside option was be was better than dealing with somebody you knew would be unethical, right? So then you'd get things that were more reputation-like in this. Yeah, um, you know, you're right. I mean, I think the social opprobrium does get rid of some of the role uh, for regulation. In fact, when you think about the Blackstone thing, um, you know, the CFTC sable rabbit a little bit and said this might be market manipulation, but the CFTC didn't want to get into that. Uh, they really would much prefer that everybody else say, Blackstone, you're a total jerk and stop screwing around. Um, and then, you know, ISDA ultimately came along and, and formalized some rules to sort of say, you know, don't be a jerk. Um, so I do think this stuff fits together with that. Let me mention- uh, uh, Sorry, that just following up a bit on Michael's, uh... Remark. Mm -hmm. It looks like there are two concepts. There's a concept of a network of social interaction and of economic interaction, and they, they might be different in principle, right? So it's a bit what also Marjana said earlier. There's a network of our 
you know, dealer relationships. And then mm -hmm. the people look at me when they see what we've done after, after, after the fact. And so, and the, the, my, and one extension of the mode might be to separate those two. Uh, I think that's two. a, I think that's a very good, a good suggestion. Um, I think when you look at say OTC markets where you have, for example, bonds where, you know, you have the big banks and, and then, you know, not every customer is the same, right? Um, you know, if I go there, do they give me a crappy price? Probably, what do they care? I'm, I'm little, you know, when I'm bigger, maybe they feel differently, but so that's an interesting direction to go, but um, we're, we haven't gotten there yet. Good point. So Let me just point out one, one other comment and then I'll come back to questions. One thing we haven't talked about is the network structure, right? Because we know, and this seems particularly relevant in the COVID world, that from, you know, we're talking about contagion, right? So we're talking about contagion of unethical behavior, but, you know, unfortunately it could be contagion of, you know, COVID or anything else. So we know from disease dynamics that not every node is as important, right? And we've seen that already when we talk about gatekeepers and others. So regulators may need to maintain critical nodes of ethical behavior to stop the spread of non-ethical behavior. But what are these nodes, right? So if you took this little example, it, it looks like I is definitely a critical node. This looks like what we did before, right? As long as I stays ethical, um, the non-ethical behavior couldn't uh, invade. But actually, it turns out in this network, it's K who's the critical node. Right. So, you know, when I think about what regulators often do, you know, if like everybody in a network back here, if everybody in a network is, you know, misbehaving you know, and I pick out one person and and charge them. Well, if they don't pick out the right one, it doesn't make any difference. Right. It doesn't change the density enough to change it. Whereas, you know, you might not have realized it, but this is the guy who if this guy turns, everybody falls, right? So one of the things that we think this suggests for regulators is understanding the network structure and understanding who is critical for you know, the, the, the movement of, of behavior across the network. Um, so bottom line, policies that target individuals without changing the cluster density have little effect. And that's really what comes out of having a model like ours. Um, does this explain the bank collusion problem as, as people, you know, moved across banks, they brought the bad behavior with them. And then now that I was bad, my, my, maybe my trader next to me went bad and we all went bad. Um, bottom line is either make a, a significant intervention or don't bother. So again, with market structure, one minute left, very good comment earlier about are some markets easier than others? I think so. Um, Direct markets where you have dealing with a customer can support ethical outcomes more easily, such as the Blackstone example, where everybody knew it was Blackstone and they're like, you know, you're a jerk, stop it. Um, the key thing here is um, if you have an anonymous market, like an, like an exchange, that's really the same thing as having no guilt. You can still get ethical behavior, but it's pretty tough. Uh, the critical density gets really, really high. And so it's harder to prevail. So with that, um, I know I'm out of time. Um, and these are the things that we think we showed you. And we are currently working on expanding to include a broader concept of guilt. And we'd also like to make networks endogenous, right? Maybe you choose the network because you think that people are gonna behave in a certain way. So you don't even wanna go into networks where you think they're really bad. We think that might be interesting. So thank you. Um, and we'll open it up if there's time for other questions. Can I, uh, oh, sure. question. So I was wondering to what extent the guilt parameter in the model plays a similar role to the discount factor in infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma games? I'm gonna let Dave take that one. Um, boy, that's hard. Honestly, I don't know. I mean, I, but I see why you're asking the question. It's it's interesting. Um, so I'd have to think about it. It's something where I just have no idea because I've never thought about that here. Thanks, Anna. That's one that's fascinating stuff. I, I, one question that sort of brings to mind also is the 
information flow in the network and the content. So, he, so here you'd actually want to hide non-ethical people and you'd want to broadcast ethical behavior, right? So, so if the regulator can actually control what you see about people, you, you wouldn't want people to know that other people are being unethical and you'd want or non-ethical. And, and so actually, you know, I think when you think about the network, you can think about who's interacting with whom, but also who sees what, right? And, mm -hmm. and that seems to be an interesting angle in terms of not just regulating, you know, trying to make the, sure that there's key gatekeepers who are ethical, but actually controlling that they get viewed more often and the people who are unethical. So it, it has, you know, if there's unethical behavior, maybe you want to punish it in private as, as opposed to public, public, publicly public punishing it here. It's sort of that's interesting. interesting. Yeah, it is. So I, actually, that's, that's interesting because you could imagine yeah. you're right. a network, different networks representing what you know about people and who you play with. And you're right. You might want to sort of praise ethical behavior and publicize it and kind of hide the non-ethical stuff. That, that's yeah. interesting. I mean, somebody that, asked a similar question in the chat, but this is much more explicit. That's a really interesting question. I, I mean, it would be fun. I think we can play around with that because you're right. In some sense, you know, if you say, gee, this entire group of people are all unethical, then it's like, great, if they're unethical, why don't I be unethical? Um, so I think you raise a really a fun point. Um, we'll, we'll definitely play with that. It's a great suggestion. Can I make like just uh, one comment about uh, how to distinguish um, your result from let's say crime and punishment type of model of uh, Gary Becker? So for example, like uh, many examples that you gave, they are kind of like illegal behavior. And there is a kind of the elephant in the room is the prosecutor there. And we have all these leniency programs and the whistleblowing programs and all this stuff. So how, um, how it would be different like uh, from a model where if there is a lot of people, if I have a lot of neighbors who behave uh, non-ethically or like uh, kind of like illegally, they are less likely to uh, to let the regulator know about my illegal behavior. But then, if everyone uh, behaves legally, then it's I need to be much more cautious. So it feels to me that this type of kind of uh, being afraid that someone will rat on you will kind of generate similar dynamics. And I'm just wondering, like, what empirically, how to distinguish these psychological games where you care about, like, how they feel about your behavior rather than like being afraid that this G could be just representing probability of being caught multiplied by the cost give. Like, you know, just try to understand like empirically how one would distinguish between this and your story. Make a stab at it, then I'm gonna make David make a stab at it too. Um, I'm not sure that everything in that we're looking at is illegal, right? Um, Blackstone, what they did wasn't illegal. Uh, on the other hand, uh, since everyone thought they were a total jerk, no one would want to deal with Blackstone in the future. So it's not a crime, but there is a punishment, right? The Lakers, what they did in terms of borrowing money wasn't illegal. But if they thought about what other people would think about their doing it, then they would have realized up front they never should have done this, right? And so once all of a sudden it became very clear that everybody thought you know, that your taking the money was not, you know, reasonable. Um, then all of a sudden they're like, uh-oh, now we're in trouble. Now, is that crime and punishment or is it, is it a broader perspective? I, I think it's a broader perspective. That's why we used non-ethical uh, instead of like unethical or illegal. Because I think it's bigger than that. I think people make decisions all the time that are not necessarily illegal because the law always lags, right? But we do think markets have some sort of ethical structure, which is why we wrote the paper. Um, but, um, you know, I, I'm not sure Mr. Becker would agree with that. David, what do you think? Um, so I actually have two answers for you. One is actually related to what Maureen said closely. And that what, we're, what I view is what we're trying to do here is to ask whether guilt and the network structure can work as a substitute for regulations, laws, or for that matter, reputation. Um, but you could imagine that this behavior is illegal 
and that you're afraid that people will report you if you behave criminally when they didn't expect you to behave criminally, which is beginning <laughs> to sound like our game. And that that G is the expected you know, punishment. Mm-hmm. It's like something someone surely must have already done. Uh, if not, someone could do it because <laughs> it sounds like it's going to give you the same kind of results we have, I think. Well, you'll get yeah, that's awesome. exactly what I was thinking. Would, yeah, that's through. that kind of must fit. Yeah. But I agree that you also could interpret it more broadly, but just when you, let's say, rely on some empirical facts that there is clustering of criminal activity or when someone moves from an ethical bank to ethical bank, like empirically, I'm just struggling, like from empirical perspective, how would you distinguish the fact that I care about other people uh, kind of uh, thinking that I'm a bad player versus other people reporting me to the authorities? That's kind of just empirical question. It's not even like... You know, question. I really like your model, so I don't want you to misunderstand my question. Yeah. yeah. Can I just uh, follow up a little bit on, on this? The way I was thinking about this, because cri- what's criminal by itself is endogenous, right? It's a law, and and maybe you also have a theory of like certain things you you do. It's it's very well accepted. We all can default on a law, and like that was one example. Like it's reasonable to expect that I'm gonna default on a law and there is nothing unethical on that by itself so you, you don't want to make that illegal but there are certain circumstances that you can default in an unethical way right so so that's when you you want you don't want to make it a crime things behaviors that should be accepted in certain circumstances but not others so the the ethics gets in there that's not a clear cut what's what's good or bad or what's illegal mm-hmm. to you know, one thing that almost seems similar to me, maybe others of you, so may bother everybody else, but, you know, think about fiduciary duties, right? You know, we have laws about what you're supposed to do, but you can't write a contract that looks at every possible eventuality and, and comes up with every possible thing. So you have fiduciary duties that say, well, you have a duty to behave with loyalty. You have a duty to behave this way. And that covers all the holes that in the contracting that you can't do. And so I, I see ethics that way too, right? That, that I agree with Bruno completely, that you know, there's some behaviors you just don't do and or may not find a law written about it, but it's there. And, and that's kind of what I think putting ethics in a, in a theory of economics is, is trying to do. Our, our guys are rational. I mean, you know, if, in, in our setting, they'll switch if it's rational. But what keeps them kind of behaving is this guilt. And without it in the model, that, that doesn't happen. Uh, I think a good example of a market where these things can happen and then not outside the law is the repo market and the repo fails. Ooh, ooh I like that. So the especially during the crisis, uh, there has been a lot of repo fails. And those are not really uh, outside the law. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not, you're not defaulting on the loan, you're just kind of late on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's conveniently late. Uh, right. And I was wondering whether in practice there have been any punishments or um, on the, on the players, market players that have repo failed, failed on the repos. Love the example. Don't know the answer. Uh, anybody else know the answer, Doug or anybody? Yeah, there is a fail. It's a 3% uh, penalty. And uh, it's actually a good idea to allow some fails. So I'm not sure it counts as end behavior. The reason being, if uh, if uh, I promise Anna to deliver securities, I'm doing it because I either have them or I might get them. If I insist that I'm not gonna promise them unless I already have them, then I probably won't do as much trading and the gains from trade will be lowered. So having, having some fails is a good idea, but just not excessive fails. And that's why they chose a 3% penalty rather than a 50% penalty. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. There's, there's, there's the same structure on short sales. Um, one, one doesn't have to have, um, you don't, you, you sell a stock short without, without actually having it. If, there's, if, there's, if you have a reasonable expectation 
uh, that you that you have your hands on it, and it's for exa- I think for exactly the same reason as Daryl was outlining. Chester, it, I guess the interesting question is: suppose that somebody fails a lot, and they fail because now it's not in their best interest to deliver, so they don't want to do it. Do you think the market then basically after a point says, "I don't want to deal with this person"? Well, I, I certainly expect that, but I, I even would expect that the SEC probably would bring an enforcement action. Um, um, in, in a case, in a case like that, if they if they thought if they thought if they thought, if they thought there was a deliberate, you know, if they thought there was a deliberate pattern uh, of of behavior, and that goes back to in, intent, intent, which is more kind of a lawyer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This goes back to the uh, issue that I raised with David in the chat during your talk, Maureen, is whether you could establish links in the network endogenously, based on a history of ethical behavior saying I'm willing to to contract with Maureen because she has had a history of not behaving non-ethically. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, that's where we were kind of thinking of these endogenous network connections, um, which we haven't done yet. Um, but I, I do think that seems sensible, doesn't it? And, um, um, but, and it does, it, it, you know, again, I like the idea of building in an idea that ethics matters. Uh, and it's not just, you know, the legal structure that determines everything. Um, but we, we, we obviously have more work to do if we're gonna build that out. Cool. Well, thank you everyone. We got some great comments, uh, really appreciate them. And, uh, you know, thank you very much for inviting us to, uh, to present this. Thanks, Marie. Um, Bruno, do you want to mention a little bit about the chat? Yes, uh, we have a Wonder Room. I don't know which of you are familiar with this. It works uh, basically as a Zoom website, but you can kind of split in groups. So you can have like a, a group talk with Maureen, a group talk with David. Uh, so uh, right now we, we I posted the link on the chat. So you can just click the link. Uh, the password is ethics. Uh, and if you guys want to join, uh, some of us will be there uh, where to talk more about the paper. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And I will stop the recording for now. Thanks.